The Talatalalka massacre was the killing of students and civilians by military and police on October 2, 1968, in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas in the Talatalalca section of Mexico City. The events are considered part of the Mexican Dirty War, when the government used its forces to suppress political opposition. The massacre occurred roughly ten days before the opening of the 1968 Summer Olympics in Mexico City. The head of the Federal Directorate of Security reported that 1,345 people were arrested. At the time, the government and the media in Mexico claimed that government forces had been provoked by protesters shooting at them, but government documents made public since 2000 suggest that snipers had been employed by the government. According to U.S. National Security Archives, Kate Doyle, a senior analyst of U.S. policy in Latin America, documented the deaths of 44 people. However, estimates of the death toll range the actual number from 300 to 400, with eyewitnesses reporting hundreds dead. Topic. Background The Mexican government invested a massive $150 million in preparation for the 1968 Olympics to be hosted in Mexico City. That amount was equal to roughly $1 billion by today's terms. Mexican President Gustavo Díaz Ordaz struggled to maintain peace during a time of rising social tensions but suppressed movements by labor unions and farmers fighting to improve their lot. His administration suppressed independent labor unions, farmers, and was heavy-handed in trying to direct the economy. In 1958 under the previous administration of Adolfo López Mateos, labor leader Demetrio Vallejo had tried to organize independent railroad unions, which the Mexican government quickly ended. It arrested Vallejo under a violation of Article 145 of the Penal Code, which defined social dissolution. As a crime, arising from reaction to the government's violent repression of fights between rival poros gangs, the student movement in Mexico City quickly grew to include large segments of the student body who were dissatisfied with the regime of the PRI. Sergio Zermeno has argued that the students were united by a desire for democracy, but their understanding of what democracy meant varied widely. Topic. National Strike Council CNH. Officially formed after the Mexican government's violation of university autonomy during the summer of 1968, the National Strike Council Consejo Nacional de Huelga or CNH organized all subsequent protests against the Díaz Ordaz government. The CNH was a democratic delegation of students from 70 universities and preparatory schools in Mexico. It coordinated protests to promote social, educational, and political reforms. At its apex, the CNH had 240 student delegates and made all decisions by majority vote, had equal representation by female students, and reduced animosity among rival institutions. Raúl Álvarez Guerin, Socrates Campos Limas, Marcelino Pirello, and Gilberto Guevara Niebla served as the four de facto leaders of the CNH. As the world focused on Mexico City for the Olympics, the CNH leaders sought to gain peaceful progress for festering political and social grievances. The CNH elaborated a six-point petition. Repeal of Articles 145 and 145b of the Penal Code which sanctioned imprisonment of anyone attending meetings of three or more people, deemed to threaten public order. The abolition of Granaderos, the tactical police corps. Freedom for political prisoners. Compensation paid to those injured during disturbances. The identification of officials responsible for previous bloodshed including July and August meetings. The dismissal of the chief of police, Luis Cueto, his deputy, Raúl Mendialea, and the Granandero commander, General A. Frias. Topic. Assault on vocational school number 5. On July 22, 1968, a riot between rival teenage gangs broke out in downtown Mexico City. Most members of these gangs were students at the vocational schools No. 2 and No. 5 pitted against members enrolled at the Isaac Ochaderena Preparatory School. The fight started when the former threw stones at the glass windows of the latter school. The riots resumed the following day. Answering the call to restore order, the police entered with force into vocational school No. 5, claiming that it was to capture members of street gangs who had enrolled in the school. 
The Granaderos riot police were used by the Mexican government to control and suppress the student demonstrators and they were first used against the students in July 1968. However, the riot police assaulted numerous students and teachers in the process of clearing vocational school No. 5. In an informal interview with some Granaderos, Antonio Carrega recounted that the Granaderos said that the authorities gave the men in the riot squad 30 pesos for every student they clubbed and hauled off to jail. The student movement began to coalesce after the government's assault on vocational school No. 5, which marked the first major infringement on student autonomy. The movement began to gain support from students outside the capital and from other segments of society, which continued to build until that October. Students formed brigadas brigades, groups of six or more students who distributed leaflets about the issues in the streets, markets, and most often on public buses. These parochial organizations, the smallest units of the CNH, decided the scope and issues which the student movement would take up. These included both rural and urban concerns. The brigadistas would board buses to speak to the passengers about the government's corruption and repression, while others distributed leaflets and collected donations. Eventually, the passengers and bus drivers began to sympathize with the students' demands for democracy and justice, and the students collected increasing amounts of money. But the aggressive militancy among the students began to disillusion some bus drivers about the students' motives, and they suspected the use of seeking power for its own sake. Topic. Protest at Anam On August 1, National Autonomous University of Mexico Anam Rector Bajos Sierra led 50,000 students in a peaceful protest against the repressive actions of the government and violation of university autonomy. The orderliness of the demonstration proved to the Mexican public that the students were not rabble-rousers. Additionally, the demonstration showed it unlikely that communist agitators could have coordinated the students' actions. The protest route was planned specifically to avoid the Zocalo Mexico City's main plaza. The current Anam website stated that the march route began from University City CU, ran along Insurgents Avenue to Felix Cuevas, turn on Felix Cuevas towards Coyacan Avenue, and returned by University Avenue back to the starting point. The march proceeded without any major disturbances or arrests. On September 9, Bajos Sierra issued a statement to the students and teachers to return to classes. Our institutional demands, have been essentially satisfied by the recent annual message by the Citizen President of the Republic. The CNH issued a paid announcement in the newspaper, El Dia, for the silent march on September 13. It invited, all workers, farmers, teachers, students, and the general public, to participate in the march. The CNH emphasized that it had no connection with the 20th Olympic Games, or with the national holidays commemorating Mexico's independence, and that this committee has no intention of interfering with them in any way. The announcement reiterated the list of six demands from the CNH. With the opening of the Olympics approaching, Diaz Ordaz was determined to stop these demonstrations. In September, he ordered the army to occupy the Anam campus. They took the campus without firing a bullet, but beat and arrested students indiscriminately. Bajos Sierra resigned in protest on September 23. <inaudible> <inaudible> Occupation of IPN the Polytechnic. Students began to prepare for defensive operations in other institutions. They put on a much stronger resistance when the police and the army tried to occupy the polytechnic campuses of Zacatenco and Santo Tomas. The battle lasted from 1700 hours on September 23 to the early hours of September 24. The physician Justo Igor de Leon Loyola wrote in his book, La Noche de Santo Tomas Saint Thomas's Night. Today I have seen bloodier fights, unequal battles, both sides are armed. But what a difference in the weapons, .22 caliber handguns against M1 military rifles, bazookas against Molotov cocktails." The Polytechnic students held their campuses against the army for more than 12 hours, which aroused strong opposition by the government. The French journal L'Express stated that 15 people died in the battles and that more than 1,000 bullets were fired. The government reported three dead and 45 injured people. Students from the Santo Tomas campus who were arrested in the occupations later said that they had been concentrated for defense in the entry lobbies. 
The military shot at them randomly and some of their friends did not survive. Topic. Massacre On October 2, 1968, around 10,000 university and high school students gathered in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas to protest the government's actions and listen peacefully to speeches. Many men and women not associated with the CNH gathered in the plaza to watch and listen, they included neighbors from the residential complex, bystanders and children. The students had congregated outside the Chihuahua Building, a three-moduled 13-story apartment complex in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas. Among their chants were No Queremos Olimpiada, Queremos Revolución, We don't want Olympics, we want revolution. Rally organizers did not try to call off the protest when they noticed an increased military presence in the area. Two helicopters, one from the police, and another one from the army, flew over the plaza. Around 5.55 p.m. red flares were shot from the nearby SRE Mexican Ministry of Foreign Relations tower. Around 6.15 p.m. another two flares were shot, this time from a helicopter one was green and another one was red as 5,000 soldiers, 200 tankettes and trucks surrounded the plaza. Much of what proceeded after the first shots were fired in the plaza remained ill-defined for decades after 1968. Records and information released by American and Mexican government sources since 2000 have enabled researchers to study the events and draw new conclusions. The question of who fired first remained unresolved years after the massacre. The Mexican government said gunfire from the surrounding apartments prompted the army's attack. But the students said that the helicopters appeared to signal the army to fire into the crowd. Journalist Elena Poniatowska called interviews from those present and described events in her book Massacre in Mexico. Flares suddenly appeared in the sky overhead and everyone automatically looked up. The first shots were heard then. The crowd panicked and started running in all directions. Despite CNH efforts to restore order, the crowd on the plaza quickly fell into chaos. Shortly thereafter, the Olympia Battalion, a secret government branch made for the security of the Olympic Games composed of soldiers, police officers, and federal security agents, were ordered to arrest the leaders of the CNH and advanced into the plaza. The Olympia Battalion members wore white gloves or white handkerchiefs tied to their left hands to distinguish themselves from the civilians and prevent the soldiers from shooting them. Captain Ernesto Morales Soto stated that Immediately upon sighting a flare in the sky, the prearranged signal, we were to seal off the aforementioned two entrances and prevent anyone from entering or leaving. The ensuing assault into the plaza left dozens dead and many more wounded in its aftermath. The soldiers responded by firing into the nearby buildings and onto the crowd, hitting not only the protesters, but also watchers and bystanders. Demonstrators and passers-by alike, including students, journalists one of which was Italian reporter Oriana Falacci, and children, were hit by bullets, and mounds of bodies soon lay on the ground. Meanwhile, on the Chihuahua building, where the speakers stood, Olympia Battalion members pushed people and ordered them to lie on the ground near the elevator walls. People claim these men were the people who shot first at the soldiers and the crowd. Video evidence also points out that at least two companies of the Olympia Battalion hid themselves in the nearby apartment buildings and set up a machine gun in an apartment on the Molino del Rey building, where a sister in law of then Secretary of State Luisa Echevarria lived, the Church of Santiago de Tlatelolca, where snipers were positioned into the roof, the nearby convent, and the Foreign Relations Tower, where there were many people involved, including the ones who fired the first two flares a machine gun on the 19th floor, and a video camera on the 17th floor. Video evidence shows ten white-gloved men leaving the church and bumping into soldiers, who point their weapons at them. One of the men shows what appears to be an ID, and they are let go. The killing continued throughout the night, with soldiers and policemen operating on a house-to-house -house basis in the apartment buildings adjacent to the square. The Chihuahua building as well as the rest of the neighborhood had its electricity and phones cut off. Witnesses to the event claim that the bodies were first removed in ambulances and later military officials came and piled up bodies, not knowing if they were dead or alive, into the military trucks, while some say that the bodies were piled up on garbage trucks and sent to unknown destinations. The soldiers rounded up the students onto the Chihuahua building's elevator walls, stripped them, and beat them. 
3,000 attendees were taken to the convent next to the church and were left there until early in the morning, most of these being people that had little to nothing in common with the students and were only neighbors, bystanders, passers-by and others who were on the plaza just to listen to the speech. Other witnesses claim that in the later days, Olympia Battalion members would disguise themselves as utilities employees and inspect the houses in search of students. The official government explanation of the incident was that armed provocateurs among the demonstrators, stationed in buildings overlooking the crowd, had begun the firefight. Suddenly finding themselves sniper targets, the security forces had simply returned the shooting in self-defense. By the next morning, newspapers reported that 20 to 28 people had been killed, hundreds wounded, and hundreds more arrested. Most of the Mexican media reported that the students provoked the army's murderous response with sniper fire from the apartment buildings surrounding the plaza. LDIA's morning headline on October 3, 1968, read as followed: "Criminal provocation at the Tlatelolco meeting causes terrible bloodshed." The government-controlled media reported the Mexican government's side of the events that night, but the truth eventually emerged. A 2001 investigation revealed documents showing that the snipers were members of the Presidential Guard, who were instructed to fire on the military forces in order to provoke them. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Investigation and response. In 1998, President Ernesto Zedillo, on the 30th anniversary of the Tlatelolco massacre, authorized a congressional investigation into the events of October 2. However, the PRI government continued its recalcitrance and did not release official government documents pertaining to the incident. In a 2002 All Things Considered radio interview with Kate Doyle, director of the Mexican Documentation Project for the U.S. National Security Archive, she described the PRI government's investigations. I mean, there have been a number of investigations throughout the years. In fact, former President Miguel de la Madrid was interviewed yesterday in the press, and said that he had asked the military and the interior secretary for documents and for photographs of the demonstrations, and was subjected to tremendous political pressure not to investigate. And when he continued to press, the military and the interior ministry claimed that their files were in disarray and they had nothing. Enduring questions remained after La Noche Triste, the sad night that have taken the Mexican government over 30 years to answer. Eventually in 2001, President Vicente Fox, the president who ended the 70-year reign of the PRI, attempted to resolve the question of who had orchestrated the massacre. President Fox ordered the release of previously classified documents concerning the 1968 massacre. The documents revealed that Elena Poniatowska's synthesis of the events that October night was accurate. As Kate Doyle uncovered, thousands of students gathered in the square and, as you say, the government version is that the students opened fire. Well, there's been pretty clear evidence now that there was a unit that was called the Brigda Olympica, or the Olympic Brigade, that was made up of special forces of the Presidential Guard, who opened fire from the buildings that surrounded the square, and that that was the thing that provoked the massacre. President Fox also appointed Ignacio Carrillo Prieto in 2002 to prosecute those responsible for ordering the massacre. In 2006, former President Luis Echeverria was arrested on charges of genocide. However, in March 2009, after a convoluted appeal process, the genocide charges against Echeverria were dismissed. The Mexican newspaper The News reported that a tribunal of three circuit court judges ruled that there was not enough proof to link Echeverria to the violent suppression of hundreds of protesting students on October 2, 1968." Despite the ruling, Prosecutor Carrillo Prieto said he would continue his investigation and seek charges against Echeverria before the United Nations International Court of Justice and the Inter-American Human Rights Commission. U.S. government records In October 2003, the role of the United States government in the massacre was publicized when the National Security Archive at George Washington University published a series of records from the CIA, the Pentagon, the State Department, the FBI and the White House which were released in response to Freedom of Information Act requests. The documents detail that in response to Mexican government concerns over the security of the Olympic Games, the Pentagon sent military radios, weapons, ammunition and riot control training material to Mexico before and during the crisis. 
that the CIA station in Mexico City produced almost daily reports concerning developments within the university community and the Mexican government from July to October. Six days before the massacre at Tlatelolca, both Echeverria and head of federal security DFS Fernando Gutierrez Barrios told the CIA that, "...the situation will be under complete control very shortly." That the Díaz Ordaz government, "...arranged," to have student leader Socrates Campos Limas accuse dissident PRI politicians such as Carlos Madrazo of funding and orchestrating the student movement. Remembrance In 1993, in remembrance of the 25th anniversary of the events, a steel was dedicated with the names of a few of the students and persons who lost their lives during the event. The Supreme Court of Justice of the Nation has a mural commemorating the massacre. During June 2006, days before the controversial presidential election of 2006, 84-year-old Echeverria was charged with genocide in connection with the massacre. He was placed under house arrest pending trial. In early July of that year, after the presidential elections, he was cleared of genocide charges, as the judge found that Echeverria could not be put on trial because the statute of limitations had expired. In December 2008 the Mexican Senate named 2 October starting in 2009 as a national day of mourning. The initiative had already passed the Deputies Chamber of Congress. 40th Anniversary March On October 2, 2008, two marches were held in Mexico City to commemorate the event. One traveled from Escuela Normal Superior de Maestros Teachers College to the Zócalo. The other went from the Instituto Politécnico Nacional to the massacre site of the Plaza de las Tres Culturas. According to the Comité del 68, 68 Committee, one of the organizers of the event, 40,000 marchers were in attendance. Topic. Media portrayals In 1969, Mexican rock band Pop Music Team, launched the single Tlatelolca but was heavily censored by the government after a few days of airplay. Rojo Amanecer 1989, directed by Jorge Fons, is a Spanish-language film about the event. It focuses on the day of a middle-class family living in one of the apartment buildings surrounding the Plaza de Tlatelolca and is based on testimonials from witnesses and victims. It starred Héctor Bonilla, Maria Rojo, the Bichir brothers, Eduardo Palomo and others. Alejandro Jodorowsky dramatized the massacre in the Holy Mountain 1973, with birds, fruits, vegetables, liquids and other things falling and being ripped out of the wounds of the dying students. Richard Dindo, a documentary filmmaker, has made Ni Olvido, Ni Perdón 2004, which includes contemporary interviews with witnesses and participants as well as footage from the time. A feature film, Tlatelolca, Verano del 68, was released in Mexico, November, 2012, written and directed by Carlos Bellotto. Roberto Bolaño released Amulet, a Spanish-language novel, in 1999, recounting the tragedy from the point of view of a woman named Auxilio, based on the true story of Alcira Saust Scafo. Auxilio was caught in the university bathroom at the time of the police ambush. She tells her story also in his later novel The Savage Detectives, Borer de la Memoria, a movie about a journalist who investigates a girl who was killed in July 1968, lightly touches the massacre, which is filmed by Roberto Renteria, a CUEC student who was making a documentary about said girl, known popularly as La Empaquetada for the way her dismembered body was found inside a box. Los Parasitos, a movie, 2015, also takes place at the date, references Tlatelolca heavily and portrays the conflict between student and government. Jardin, a song by Mexican artist Maya Gazal, features a two-minute audio sample recorded during the shooting at the Plaza de las Tres Culturas. See also List of massacres in Mexico Tiananmen Massacre Kent State Shootings Topic. References Topic. Further reading The Ghosts of Mexico 1968. The Economist, 24 April 2008 
Ecker, Ronald L. April 1, 2009. The Tlatelolca Massacre in Mexico. Retrieved 27 July 2010. Flaherty, George F. Hotel Mexico, Dwelling on the 68 Movement, University of California Press, 2016. Lucas, Jeffrey Kent. The Rightward Drift of Mexico's Former Revolutionaries, The Case of Antonio Diaz Soto y Gama, Lewiston, New York, Edwin Mellon Press, 2010. Paniatowska, Elena, Trans, by Lane, Helen R., Massacre in Mexico original title La Noche de Tlatelolca, or The Night of Tlatelolca, New York, Viking, 1975 ISBN 0-8262-0817-7. Taibo II, Paco Ignacio, 68, New York, Seven Stories Press, 2003 ISBN 1-58322-608-7. Topic external links Tlatelolca archival footage and film, Canal 6 de Julio and Lane, Hornada National Security Archive, George Washington University unedited photographs of the massacre in Spanish video documentary of the 40th anniversary march.